Hello, Market Insights watchers. Well, this week in Market Roundup, the latest U.S. inflation data is out. Uh, we'll discuss what it means for stocks and Fed rate cut probabilities for 2024. And tech megatrends, find out what stock we're going to give you a ticker to buy for the rising AI-powered data center market. And in Crypto Corner, Ian will talk about Bitcoin's recent breakout and some other very interesting statistics. So remember to please subscribe to this YouTube channel on the Banning Hill YouTube channel. We love to have your patronage. So let's get started. Hi, Ian. How are you? Great, Amber. What's new? Nothing new, just, you know, daily grind, as we say. <laughs> yeah, but we love it, though, right? The, the one thing that um, I find so fascinating about markets is, like, it's a new ball game every day. Oh, hello. It's true. And and, and, and when, I, when I worked at Solomon Brothers, mm -hmm. one of the traders once told me that, you know, if you're in sales, some days you can come up and it's just practice, right? Okay. But if you're a trader, you got to play the game every single day. You got to, you're in the game. It's mm -hmm. never practice. And mm -hmm. uh, that's what has always really inspired me and why I've been so passionate about markets because there's just so much information to take in and synthesize and mm -hmm. come up with actionable investment ideas. So I love doing this. I know you do too. No, I do. I'm with you there, Ian. It's it's a dream to have a job like this. So it's really awesome. I agree. And thank you. That's why we're so grateful for all our listeners and subscribers are right in. It's so true. Us. Thank you for everything, everyone for, for who's watching right now. Okay, so in Market Roundup, uh, last Thursday's Personal Consumption Expenditures or PCE Index print, uh, the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation metric matched economists' estimates. The January reading showing core PCE prices, uh, which strip out volatile food and energy components, rose 2.8%. Uh, this is a reading that was in line with expectations, really thereby increasing chances or bets that the central bank may cut rates as early as June. We'll see. Uh, stocks and bonds rose on this inflation data report. And as Bloomberg News uh, actually points out, quote, while the PCE is above the central bank's 2% target, validating officials' wait and see approach, the data helped allay concerns about more significant inflation increases. End quote. So Fed Bank of San Francisco President Mary Daly uh, stated central bank officials are, quote, ready to make moves and adjust as the data demands us to do so, end quote. But noted, there's no urgency to cut rates due to the current, which she sees, strength in the U.S. economy. A uh, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester said last Thursday that the latest reading on inflation doesn't alter her prediction for three rate cuts later in 2024. Now. On a consumer level, uh, for those in the market for a new home or a new car or a, a just a pre-owned car, a rate relief really is palatable. A uh, car loan rejections are up as Americans, especially those with lower credit scores, are having a harder time uh, qualifying for an auto loan due to high interest rates as well as coupled with elevated car prices. Uh, even consumers in with healthy finances and credit scores are seeing more difficulty securing these auto loans. And I'll leave it with this. The Fed probability rate cut for a June now stands at about 62%, but subject to change. So Ian, ah, it's getting more difficult out there with these um, loans for personal, for consumers. Yeah, definitely subject to change. And, you know, you mentioned the PCE. Well, one um, economic inflation data point that we've also been following for the last couple of years is this true inflation index. Yes. And it's basically an alternative set of data that better tracks inflation in the economy. I'm looking at it right now, Amber, 1.71% year on year change in the cost of goods. It's also turned down pretty significantly uh, since in the last week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th th this points, this is kind of a leading indicator because mm -hmm. it's it's more up to date than what the Fed and the government reports. So I, I think we're going to continue to see inflation coming down, even though that PC was a little, you know, warmer than than you would like to see. Mm -hmm. The other note, too, is that there was also some exogenous factors going on outside of inflation. So yeah. right now, New York Community Bank Corps, uh, as of the last week, last couple of weeks, down about 70%. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing significant strains in the commercial real estate market. Um, 
I don't know whether or not this is uh, it becomes a contagion. It might be just kind of, you know, they made some bad loans in New York and some buildings that uh, are underperforming, especially on the commercial real estate side. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely warning watching. I'm sure the Fed is watching that. And it's it's always when the Fed cuts, it's usually like they don't say, oh, OK, we're going to cut 25 basis points. It's sometimes it's like there's an emergency. So we're going to do cut for 50 or 100 basis points. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are definitely some things happening like that are bubbling up that could be emergencies. Similar to what we saw a year ago, if you remember, just we had the Silicon Valley bank crisis oh, yes. where these banks had bought a ton of U.S. treasuries during 2020 and 2021 when rates were really low when rates went up the value of those treasury holdings they had went down significantly you know if you bought a 30 year this is a crazy story but if you bought a US treasury 30 year bond at you know the low in rates in 2020 during covid mm -hmm. um the, the and you bought that issuance i think it was like a a, a 1.75 uh coupon bond Mm -hmm. At one point last year, you were actually down 50% on your capital investment. And mm -hmm. so the banks that had bought those 10 year and 30 year bonds mm -hmm. saw big, you know, no um, losses in their capital. So what the treasury did is they stepped in and they said, any bond that you have, you can basically give to us as collateral and we'll give you the par value of it. So they basically protected the banks from having to take any losses on the treasury bonds. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think they're going to extend, extend the same warm felt gratitude for loans they made on commercial real estate. But, you know, I don't think the Fed and the Treasury want to see a bunch of, you know, local community banks go under because of strains in the commercial real estate market. So, you know, this is definitely something we're watching. What I think is going to play out in the market if you do have an emergency situation is you have a panic sell off in the market and then the Fed steps in the so-called Fed put, and people realize that rates are going to be lower in the future. And then mm -hmm. they go back and they start buying stocks again. And it's always led by technology too. Like the strongest stocks that are right now that have been grinding higher, NVIDIA, AMD and such, mm -hmm. might at some point see very sharp drops on mm -hmm. this New York community bank issue. Mm -hmm. But then when the Fed steps in, you'll see them rally back first. And I think it's going to present a buying opportunity um, because I do think the year is going to finish higher than it is right now. Okay. Excellent. Excellent information. But it's never a straight line, right? No. Like, I could say at the end of the year, I think we'll be higher than they are now, but it's not a straight line. Every bull market, every year in a bull market has at least three, five percent pullback. So don't feel like you know you're missing out. Uh if we see the stocks grind higher every day. Remember there's going to be an opportunity. But the problem is when it's time to buy, people don't want to buy. That's mm. that's the problem. That's yep. the problem. But that's why we're here. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, everyone. So in tech megatrends, uh, we have a stock which Ian just mentioned in a strategic fortunes portfolio that's at the heart of artificial intelligence or AI revolution. Uh, that stock, of course, is AMD, Advanced Micro Devices, and it currently has an open gain in our portfolio of 322% since being added or recommended. Now, a new Bloomberg intelligence report suggests that AMD may have more gains in the future thanks to AI-powered data centers. Now, data centers are literally massive, huge buildings with a lot of power, uh, cooling and computers. They are really physical facilities that organizations use to safely store critical applications and data. Now, in the age of AI, data centers are now the quote unquote physical epicenter of AI. So here's what the study uncovered. AI-powered data center growth is poised to accelerate. A quote, AMD's revenue is expected to rise toward $26 billion this year and grow at an even faster rate in 2025 to a record high of $32 billion, according to consensus. Data centers and embedded products where significant growth drivers are over the last 12 months, contributing more than 50% of 2023 revenue. And in 2024, data center and client segment revenue is forecast to increase by a strong double digit percentage. Now a continued focus on expanding its data center market share, both organically and through acquisitions may position AMD for near best in class growth, end quote. So, if you don't yet own shares in AMD, consider buying some, but just as Ian pointed out, 
We may see a, a, some uh, drawbacks in AMD stock. You want to buy on the dip if that happens. But if you're not, and just consider that for when you do buy shares. And if you're not yet a member of Strategic Fortunes, well, please click the bull icon right here above my shoulder uh, to learn how to subscribe and gain access to a curated, handpicked list of stock recommendations for today's market. So Ian, that's that. Any, how do you feel awesome. about this AMD report? I thought it was pretty interesting. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've loved the stock since before <laughs> it was under a hundred. You know, you don't have to convince me. Okay. It, it, obviously, they're they're not the the global leader in data center chips. That's the king of that is Nvidia. Yes. AMD is making a strong case for stealing market share, mm -hmm. and you know the the data center business is what's pushing top line revenue growth. I think though that with uh, the adoption of AI, mm. um we're reigniting a new PC cycle. So that's even a bigger story than data center business because they make most of their money selling PC chips. True, true. And yeah, and you, you know, like a year ago, people were worried about the PC cycle because remember in 2020, Amber, mm -hmm. when everybody started working from home and started getting stimulus checks from the government, they yeah. went out and bought iPhones, new PCs, mm -hmm. whatever. So you had a big PC cycle in 2020 and 2021, which drove AMD and some other stocks in our... Uh, strategic Fortune portfolio, especially this month's uh, idea. And mm -hmm. and what I think we're seeing now is AI driving that PC cycle again, mm -hmm. because to handle some of these AI applications, like the ones that Andrew is using uh, to, to run our AI data screener programs, you have to have faster chips. Yes. So we're going to start this cycle over again. Most of those computers are four years old. Mm -hmm. um, I've got an Apple uh, uh PC here with like the M1 chip and this thing is like too slow already and the, I've only had it for two years so mm -hmm. um I think that is the big the, the data center but then I think the new PC cycle is even bigger for AMD oh beautiful yep I agree so many friends for AMD can just really outperform so glad to hear that too Ian yeah and you know the key is like not to miss that cycle right yes. when there is like a a new cycle happening of people upgrading whether it be cars iPhones PCs mm -hmm. Right. Those sales dr like grow significantly on a quick two year period. And that's the time to get into the stocks right when that cycle starts. And I think that's why AMD keeps moving up is the data center and the PC cycle. Mm -hmm. And there's other stocks that are telling you as well that this PC cycle is starting again. Love it. OK, so with that, Ian, let's hear what's happening in crypto and what's going on with Bitcoin. What a <laughs> what a week. huh? Yeah, I know. Um, so. I just want to point out one stat for everyone because everyone knows Bitcoin's above 60,000. Mm -hmm. But this is one stat, one takeaway from this week. It's that on February 27th, mm -hmm. um, there's what, a dozen Bitcoin ETFs now. Okay. Right. And every time you go in your retirement account, and you buy a Bitcoin ETF. On the other side, that ETF manager has to go buy Bitcoin to match that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're buying an ETF and they're going to buy equivalent amount of Bitcoin somewhere else. On February 27th, this is crazy. The ETFs bought 9,000 Bitcoins. Wow. Okay. 9,000, they bought 9,000 Bitcoins. Okay. Guess how many Bitcoins were actually, I guess how much new supply actually came to the market that day. Mm, 9,000 Bitcoins were bought that day. Guess how many that the miners mined that day. Was it under a thousand around there? You're onto it. Okay. 900. 900. Oh, wow. There were 900 Bitcoins mined on mm. February 27th. Mm -hmm. There were 9,000 Bitcoins bought. There mm. was 10 times more demand than there was supply issued. Wow. And guess what, Amber? What? We are a month and a half away from the halving. And you know what's going to happen? <laughs> I think we're going to see some gains there, Ian. <laughs> Well, the halving means yeah. that the supply is going to get cut in half. Mm -hmm. So yeah. after around April 20th, mm -hmm. the amount of new Bitcoins issued is going to go from 900 a day to 450. Wow. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if demand is going to be constant, mm -hmm. but what I really sense is happening in Bitcoin and, and the rest of the crypto market is, is a different story as well. It's also going up. Ethereum is moving up because there's going to be an Ethereum ETF sooner than later, Solana as well. What is happening with Bitcoin and something that I've been saying for years is that people and institutions are buying it as a diversifier to their portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you 
when, when you're a young fund manager or you're in college and you're studying what's called modern portfolio theory, it was developed by this guy Markowitz in the 50s, mm -hmm. it's basically that to own the best, uh, to have the most robust investment portfolio, you have to own a number of different assets, right? So the key is to have bonds, stocks, commodities, real estate. You know, you can if you're rich, you can own some art, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is quickly becoming a part of that portfolio. Mm. And what I'm telling you is that the younger generation doesn't care about gold. Mm. Okay. The millennials realize that we are in the digital age and Bitcoin is digital money and it is non correlated with fiat money. Mm -hmm. And this is happening because more and more people are believing it. That's it. It's not like, there's something written in the science that says that Bitcoin has to be a diversifier or store of value. It's happening because people's beliefs are changing in real time. Mm -hmm. This is happening right now. And it's happening even faster because you can add it to your retirement portfolio by buying an ETF. You don't have to open a Coinbase account. And right. so, like I said, February 27th, there are 9,000 Bitcoins bought by ETFs. There are 900 Bitcoins created that day. On April 20th, there's only going to be 400 new, 450 new Bitcoins created a day. And Amber, you know, last but not least on this is that the investors who were buying Bitcoin, 10,000, 20,000, like we've been saying, mm -hmm. <clears throat> aren't holding Bitcoin for a double or a triple. You know, most people have this as part of their portfolio and it's, you know, something that they're they're not going to get rid of too easily, which is why when the demand comes in, there aren't any sellers. So we've seen this happen in other Bitcoin cycles where 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, you know, before you know it, you're at 100,000. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this cycle is going to take us to six figure Bitcoin, just like the other cycles. You know, it used to be you could buy Bitcoin in the tens and then you can right. buy it in the tens and where you had to pay the hundreds. Then you could mm -hmm. then you could buy Bitcoin in the hundreds. Then you could buy in the thousands, then the ten thousand, then hundred thousands. You know, to me, this is all shaping up to send uh, you know, Bitcoin up above a hundred thousand. You know, I, and, and this happens very quickly. You know, it happens in a number of weeks and months. So, you know, hold on to your seats because it's, it's a volatile ride. It's like we saw. You know, last week there was a day where it went up to like 66,000 and then Coinbase couldn't handle the supply. So they had to like shut, shut the exchange and people freaked out and they sold it down 10% and then bounced right back up. So, right. you know, it's it, it's a wild ride. But if you have a, a, an allocation in your portfolio, you know, just you're sitting pretty right now. Oh, we like to be sitting pretty there, Ian. <laughs> okay, well, Bitcoin 100,000. I love it. Very good. Well, everyone, uh, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, we appreciate you. If you do have a question uh, to have addressed on the next Market Insights, please email us at marketinsights at bannonhill.com. Thanks, everyone. See you soon, Amber. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>